to Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Here God is appearing to Solomon and he's speaking to Solomon in the night. And verse 14 says, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Fathers, we come into your presence this morning. We just want to tell you that we love you. Thank you, O oh God, that we one day we'll say that's him. Into that alpha. This life into his presence. Lord, whether it be death or whether it be we be prepared and ready to step. Bless the preaching of the word this morning, Father, for it's in that Jesus Christ will be glorified and uplifted here in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I got to thinking this morning as the Lord had impressed upon my heart about preaching a message on revival. And for the life of me, I, I, like Mark said the other night, every once in a while you get, a, get one of those messages, you really struggle with God about why, Lord, why in the world should I preach about revival today and I stepped out here and looked at this and I can tell you why we need revival. Amen. A lot of people don't understand that, uh, that the one thing that we need in this day and time in which we live, uh, in our churches, in our families, in our country, and in our personal life, is revival. Uh, we, we, need to, you know, uh, we need to just uh, step back and uh, be revived once again. Like, uh, can you remember the day you got saved? And how exciting it was and all the things of God has opened up before you and you just couldn't hardly wait. That's the kind of revival we need to have. Amen. I, now, I'll be honest with you. In times past, in history, there's been some great revivals. Revivals that had seen thousands upon thousands of people saved. Revivals that had turned, uh, that turned nations around. Revivals that had uh, gone into the land of Scotland and turned the entire country of Scotland around uh, for the cause of Christ uh, under uh, Knox. And, and England, the revivals that happened in England, so great that one of the greatest premier preachers of our day uh, in the United States left Moody Chapel to go to England and be part of that revival spirit that was there. And that there are then revivals in the, in the Americas. Lord, uh, men would preach and uh, literally it was said that people would fall in, their aisle, fall in the aisle uh, and literally pray, lay prostrate in the aisle uh, begging God to save them before it was everlasting too, too late. Revivals like we haven't seen. Flickers of fire every now and then but no real revival that has made any real difference in such a long time. I believe with all my heart that we need, and I know this is going to sound trite because you've heard it before, but we need some heaven sent. We need a heaven sent, Holy Ghost inspired, life changing revival. I, and, and, you know, I'll be honest with you that the text that we, that we read here today that God's answer to Solomon I, and Solomon had just finished building the temple of God it was magnificent in fact it was called one of the one of the wonders of the world I, it was it was so uh, magnificent that literally people would come from other countries just to see the temple of the almighty God and he had just finished it and he began his dedication prayer and, and he prayed and he literally, listen to what he said. Verse 26, chapter 6 says, well, let's back up a little bit. Verse 24. And if thy people Israel be put uh, to, the, to the worst before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee and shall return and confess thy name and pray and make supplication before thee in this house, then hear thou from heaven, 
verse 25, and, and forgive the, the sin of thy people Israel and bring them again into the land uh, which thou givest to them, uh, to their fathers, uh, to them and to their fathers. And when the heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have uh, sinned against thee, yet if thy people toward this place, pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, then, wilt the, then uh, uh, when thou dost afflict them. Then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel when thou hast taught them the good way there uh, wherein they should walk. And sin reign upon the land which thou hast given uh, unto thy people for an inheritance. Verse 36 says, uh, if, if they sin, talking about the children of Israel, uh, in God's people, he said, if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and, and, and thou be uh, angry with them, and deliver them over before thine enemies, and they carry them away captive into the land, far off or near. Yet if they rethink, bethink themselves in the land, whether they are carried captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, we have done amiss, and have dealt wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they uh, have uh, where they have carried them uh, captives, and pray toward their land which thou givest unto their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I have uh, built for thy, thy name, then hear thou from heaven, even from the dwelling place, uh, their uh, their prayer and their supplication. And maintain their cause and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. And the verse 12 of chapter 7 says, And the Lord appeared unto Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of a, a sacrifice. If I shut up, the, shut up heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my, among my people, if my people, God's talking to Solomon now in answer to the prayer of his dedication to the house of God. And God said, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God, uh, you know, uh, it amazed me that in the time when everything was going really well, I mean, if you go back and read the story that when the, the dedication, uh, the prayer was over and the sacrifices, began to be given and people were worshiping God it said the presence of God filled it to where it was an amazement that, that people would stand afar off and were amazed that the house of God was filled with the presence of God and they couldn't even minister in that place and in the midst of that glory and that power came a prayer of dedication and a prayer of supplication and a prayer for revival when the time came and the need was there. And God said, you know what, I'll send it. I'll send it, Solomon. I'll send it. In a day when they really need it, I'll send it. I got thinking about that. and yeah, I got to uh, reminiscing and thinking just a little and pondering. But Lord, why don't we have revival now? Why, why is it that, that our nation is in the shape that it is? Why is it that uh, uh, we've gone so far away from, uh, away, away from God and the things of God that, that, that just to be honest with you, uh, we, our, our motto in God we trust is almost a disgrace to repeat because we don't trust in God anymore. We're, we're not depending on Him. And I, don't, I believe that the revival is not happening. We're not seeing those Holy Ghost fires and the presence of God falling in His house because we, as God's people, cannot see the need. We have been lulled into a sense of complacency. Not taking away from anything that Mark said this morning about two or three, that's scriptural. But can I tell you something? We ought never to be satisfied with two or three in our congregation. They, they, you just, we don't see the need. 
for revival anymore. We've got modern medicine. Why should we stay on our knees praying for God's healing? Come on, y'all. Well, you know, there's some things that modern medicine can't do. Yeah, and we pray for God's healing, not really believing it's going to happen. Brother Clifford, lung cancer, with his last meeting with the doctor last Friday, they rehearsed to him something that he had just skipped over when they went uh, nine weeks ago and sat down with him and was talking about this dreaded disease. So they said, with therapy, 36 months. Clifford came in the, 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 the meeting last Friday and he's sitting there with the doctor and he, he, he said, Doc, he said, I want to ask you a question. How long am I going to have to keep these treatments up? Forever? And that, dirt, that doctor, doctor looked at him and said, Till you die. And he looked at her and said, when? And she said, we told you at the beginning of this there was no cure for this. That this was going to take your life. And this therapy, this chemo, this is just to keep you alive for a little bit longer. And Clifford's countenance changed. Can I tell you something? Even the doctor says there's no cure. But do we really believe that God can cure him? I believe he can. I believe if God chose to, to, to heal him, he could raise him up even tomorrow, and he would be absolutely cancer-free. I can give you instance after instance after instance where God has healed people with dreaded diseases. I, and God has done miraculous things. But can I tell you something? When was the last time we buried our face uh, in, in, our, in our knees or in our prayer closet and wept until the, the, the area was soaked with tears over the condition of the souls of man? We're concerned about their life. But we're not concerned about their eternal life. We're concerned that, that they're going to die. Can I, we're all going to die. He's on the way home from the doctor. And Cliff goes, wow. Never, I kind of missed that the first time. And I said, don't worry about it. You'll probably never die of cancer. You're going to have a heart attack before then. <laughs> he said, gee, thanks. I said, listen to me. At least you know. At least you know. How would you like to know God walked up and says, okay, you got six months or you got 36 months. What would you do with it? It amazes me. Yeah, the, we don't have revival anymore. We're not having revival in our churches. Our pews are empty because we just don't see the need. The children of Israel didn't see the need until after seven years of captivity in Babylon. <laughs> and they not, they, they, not of them seen the need then. Only one guy that we're, that we're told opened his windows three times a day toward the holy city, toward the temple that God had chose to place his name. And three times a day he prayed, uh, confessing the sins of his father. God, we're here because we've sinned as a nation. We're here because our fathers have sinned. We're here because they didn't uh, adhere to thy statutes and thy laws and thy commandments. We're here because sin has run rampant. God, forgive us for the sins of our father. Forgive me of my sin. Bring us back into the land, O oh God. Even when the king made a decree that if anybody asked a petition of anybody other than the king, they would be thrown into the den of lions. And knowing that, Daniel opened his windows toward Jerusalem 
three times a day and prayed. And his enemies knew it. And they wasn't about, listen to me, they wasn't about to let that revival spirit be kindled. So they went and told the king. Hey, you remember that, that decree you made? You remember how that you said you're going to throw, uh, uh, whoever made a petition of anybody, uh, you're going to put in a den of lions? The king says, yeah, I remember that. He says, your servant Daniel, praying three times a day. And the king said, what? Couldn't believe that his, his, one of his favorite people. You know, can I tell you something? Sometimes our favorite people kind of amaze us. Sometimes for the good, but most likely for the bad. But he, he said, oh, no. And he said, but has been decreed, we just decreed. And so we got Daniel. And with great fanfare, I can tell you, all of his enemies were there. And with great fanfare and hoopla, they throw Daniel into the den of lions. Put a lid on. And all that night, the king lamented and could not sleep. Paced the floor. Come the morning. Joy comes in the morning. Come the morning, he come to the den of lions. And standing outside the cover. And he said, oh, Daniel. Well, to deliver you. And Daniel, you're down in the lion's den. says, don't weep for me, king. I'm great. I'm okay. You want to come on down and put these big cats? He opened the top of it. Daniel's down there among all those lions, those ferocious beasts that hadn't eaten and had not had sustenance and who was just chomping at the bits for something. And he's down there petting them and laying on them and hugging on them. Why? Because of God's grace. And the king went and got Daniel out of the lion's den and throwed all those rascals, other rascals in. And a lot of people says, oh, they were just a big hole. Listen, the Bible says, and they were, they were eaten and broken bones before they ever hit the bottom of the pit. You see, we don't see the need. Food for thought. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Adam and Eve had two sons. And one of them killed the other one. And so God gave them a third son. Now they probably had more children than that, but we're only told about three. Cain, Abel, and Seth. And Seth to, took... Abel's place. I, I have to rehearse which one killed who. But he took Abel's place. And he became the godly line through which God in time to come is going to bring the Messiah. It's going to bring forth his son. God in the flesh so that he can redeem all mankind through the line of Seth. And you go back into the book of Genesis and you read and this is the, the, the genealogy of Adam and it goes through Adam's genealogy to, uh, to Cain, to Abel and uh, how Cain and his genealogy went and then Seth's genealogy and it goes down from this one. Uh, he uh, uh, had this individual and he at such and such age and then he begot uh, sons and daughters and he died at this age. And then that next heir that the God tells us about, I had so and so at a certain age, and he had sons and daughters, and he died at this age. And it goes all the way down through the genealogy until it comes to one man called Noah. Now, you stand with me here. God's line, God's people, Seth to Seth's son. To his grandson, to his great grandson, to his great great grandson, to his great 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 grandson, to his great 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 grandson, to his great great. How many greats is that? That's a bunch. And he goes all the way down to to one man named Noah, the son 
of Lamesh, the grandson of Methuselah, the great grandson is either grandson or great grandson of Enoch. Godly men, but when it comes to Noah, you ready for this? Where's the rest of that godly line? The Bible says, and Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Where's the rest of those people? Where's all that genealogy? Say, so, well, preacher, ah, listen to me. <laughs> they had to have done something because God said he looked down and seen the wickedness of the world that even their imagination was evil continuously. They was just looking at ways to get into trouble. They was looking at ways to get their own way. They was looking at ways to do their own thing. But Noah was serving God. He was, that's how he found grace in the eyes of God. As it was in the days of Noah. Where's all of God's people today? Hello. We're not the only church around. We're not the only born again believers. Where's the rest of them? They're out doing their own thing. As it was in the days of Noah. They're marrying and giving in marriage. Their life's just going on. As it was in the days of Lot. <laughs> I love that. Lot is standing there with Abraham. And they're looking out over the promised land. And Abraham told Lot, he said, Lot, if you go to the right, that's my right, y'all's left. He said, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And Lot, if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And the Bible says, Lot lifted up his eyes and looked toward the well-watered plains of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham sat there and says, you go this way, you go this way. This is the promised land. This is where God brought us. He looked up and took his eyes off of where God took them, where God wanted them, and got it where he wanted to go, as it was in the days of Lot. And because it was where he wanted to go, there came a time, because of his vexing of his soul, with the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, little at a time, little at a time, until it was just an accepted thing, until the men of God showed up at his door. And all of a sudden, Lot got a revival spirit. You say, well, how do you know, preacher? Because he said, I've got daughters out there that are married to sons of these men. I've got people out here in the city. Let me go tell them. They said, go tell them. You go tell them and get them with you because we're going to destroy the city tomorrow with, with fire from heaven. And you go get them. And Lot says, man, i got to go get my family. I, I've lost my family and they're out here living like the world and they're living wicked. i got to go tell them. And he went and they laughed him to scorn because his testimony, what he was telling them, didn't add up, didn't show forth what God told him was going to happen. And the next day, the Bible says the angels took him by the hand. You know why they took him by the hand? Because they was going kicking and screaming. He took him by the hand and led him out of the sin and then destroyed the cities. Mama, now we say a lot about Lot's wife, but can I tell you something? Any woman, any mother that's worth her salt going to be concerned about those babies she left in that world. It's going to be heartbreak broken about all that she left, her worldly goods, all that they had strived for, all that they had built. And she turned and looked. Can I tell you something? When God calls us out, there's no turning back. But we don't see the need now. As it was in the days of Lot, not Lot. Just go along accepting this old wicked lifestyle. 
We don't have revival today because, just to be honest with you, we don't see the need. Let me give you another reason why we don't have revival. And I still got two more points after this. Another reason we don't see revival in the day, our day and time. Because we're not willing to commit ourselves to let the revival start with me. We want revival, God. We want to see your power. We want to see your, your presence in our churches. We want to see your, your, the, the people walking the aisles again and souls being saved. We want to see the baptismal waters being stirred. Oh, God, we want to see revival. Oh, God, let the revival start there. We don't have revival because we're not willing to draw a circle, stand in the middle of it and say, let, let, God, let the revival start here. Revivals in England. Well-known preacher was contacted by nobody in the church, a little lady, actually. And she she talked to this preacher and she said, "Preacher, would you would you come and preach revival for us? We need revival." And, and he said, "You know, that's a very small rural community. There's not a lot of people out there. I, you know, I just to be honest with you, with you, basically what he's telling me is, I don't want to waste my time with such a small group. A lot of preachers are that way. And they just kept on and kept on. He said, "Okay, I'll come." And he got there. <laughs> And the first night of the revival, and I could be wrong in the, the, the numbers, so this is just for this illustration. The first night of the revival, they had like six or eight people. Not very many people at all. And that preacher had been prayed up, and he prayed, and he asked God what to preach, and God laid on his heart, and he got up and preached. The altar call was given, and all eight of those, all eight or nine of those people was at the altar, weeping and crying. And the preacher said, okay, we've had revival. That's enough. And the little lady come to him and said, if you'll come tomorrow, we'll have more people. And he said, okay. The next night came and they doubled their attendance. They preached again and the altar call was given. The altars were full again with people weeping for the souls of men. And the, they said, well, man, we've had revival. And then the little lady says, preacher, if you'll stay another night, Make this illustration a little shorter. It went on for like two weeks, and at the end of two weeks, they had hundreds there in that little community and turned that place around for the cause of Christ. And it went from there out to the homes, from the homes to other neighborhoods, to other churches. And all of a sudden, the land was alive with the fire revival. All because of two little ladies who got in their prayer closet and wouldn't let God go until he brought revival. You see, we're not willing to pay the price. We're not willing to do what it takes to have revival. Now let me give you some things that it's going to take to have revival. I can tell you why we're not having it. Because we don't see the need and we're not willing to pay the price. But let me tell you what it's going to take to have revival. You ready for this? First of all, it's going to take a numbleness of heart. And I, 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 I'll just tell you, do not make the mistake of thinking that humbleness is weakness. Humbleness is just coming to the, to the place to where you realize you're nothing without God that you're absolutely nothing without the shed blood of Jesus Christ that there's nothing good in you that that is redeemable other than the fact that you've been covered by the blood of Christ because you've called upon him in faith and became a child of God that is the only redeeming factor in our lives and when we come to realize it's not me it's God 
That's humbleness. Humbleness also comes when we become more concerned about other people than about us. But, 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 but preacher, you don't understand. You know, I got groceries to buy. I, I got gas to buy. I, I got this to buy. I got this to buy. Can I tell you something? We got a lot of things to buy, but what's, what's our money going to do us when we're dead? Come on. You see, we need to be more concerned about souls. Some of the old members. Remember when these boards were full of missionaries? There's four, one, two, three, there's six, six missionaries, six missions filled per board. 36, 36 different missionaries on 36 different fields. I think we got six now. Why? We're not, we haven't humbled ourselves. We haven't burdened ourselves for the mission field. Why would we be burdened for a mission field when we're not burdened for the field right here in Ennis? I still remember when people at the church would go out on visitation, knock on the door. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and so and so I'm at this church. And, you know, we, we'd like for you to come to church. So, well, I would. i tell you what I'll do. I'll come by and pick you up. I'll be here at 9 o'clock Sunday morning. Well, uh, you know, said, no, that's all right. I'll, I don't mind. I'll, I'll be here at 9 o'clock. And I'll tell you one better than that. I'll be here at 9 o'clock. I, you don't even have to go home and fix lunch. I'll buy your lunch today. Somebody said, well, you're just going to try to buy, pay their way and, and, and buy them, bribe them to come to church. Can I tell you something? It's worth a hamburger to get somebody saved. What happened to that? Did I lose my mic? Is it going in and out? Tucker, go ahead and turn the lapel of this off. Five more minutes anyway, and then it's going to go to another tape. They're going to have two tapes on this one message. But what happened? What happened? We haven't humbled ourselves. We haven't come to the place of where we said, God, it's more about you than it is about me. It's more about the souls of men than it is about me. See, God says the reason we're not to send uh, that, it, you've got to humble yourselves first. And then you've got to pray. Now, listen to me. We've got to pray in church. Our ladies pray together Sunday evening, Wednesday evening. We're back that old time midweek prayer service. Have a prayer list we go over. We pray for those that are on the prayer list. Some we don't know, but we, people know us, and they've asked us to pray, and so we pray for people. Still praying. But he said, you know what? Now listen to me. When he's talking about this prayer, that's the prayer of a Daniel. That's a prayer that's consistent. Day in and day out. That's consistent no matter what the circumstances. A number of years ago, Brother Gary was here. Him and Miss Sharon was on vacation. And they came by the house on Friday and they they stopped and I asked Gary I said well won't y'all just spend the night you know tomorrow's Saturday and y'all just spend the night and and you get up and go home tomorrow and Gary says I can't I said why he said we got visitation tomorrow and it don't look good if the preacher's not out on visitation when the church is called to visit to go out on visit and I looked him dead in the eye and said, what's one day going to make the difference? And he kind of leaned up on that kitchen table with his elbow and said, the difference between hell and heaven to somebody. 
he could have poked me in the eye and not hurt as much as that. Can I tell you something? We just get to the place that we don't pray like we ought to. We're not consistent. And we don't. I've used the illustration before. If we're going to pray for rain, bring an umbrella. If we're going to pray for souls, let's get out and knock some doors. If we're going to pray for the souls of men, then let's get those, let's go out and get them. Go out into the hedges and highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Now, we, we don't humble ourselves. We don't pray. Oh, can I, one more. <laughs> he said, seek the face of God. You know what? I, I love it. You know, when Mama wanted to get our attention, she'd put your little chubby cheeks between her hands, and she would turn your head to where she's looking eyeball to eyeball with you. And basically what she's saying is, I don't want you to look at any place else. I want you to see my face. I want you to see the seriousness in my face. I want you to see the expression on my face. I want you to see that, 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 that what is in my eye that's telling you where and what you're supposed to do. I want you to seek my face right here. Yes, ma'am. And can, can I tell you something? She did that enough times that I could read her eyes. Amen. I could tell you when she was ticked. I could tell you when she was playing, and I could tell you when I was fixing to get a whipping, and I could tell you when I was going to throw one of the other brothers under the bus. It, it just, cause I, I, she had my attention. God said, I want you to seek my face. I want you to come and, 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 and get to the place to where I've got your attention. Not someplace else. Not looking over here, looking over there, looking someplace else. And I've got to tell it, baby. Miss Webster used to do that with our son. And she would say, look at my face, boy. I want you to look me in the eye. And Daniel told her one day when he's a lot older, she wasn't going to be baptized. He said, Mama... I tried to look at you, look you in the eye, but you was always looking over the top of my head. I kept trying to look. God said, then you know what? You seek my face, you're going to find him. You're going to find him looking eyeball to eyeball with you. The problem is we don't seek God's face anymore. We don't seek what God would have us to do. We don't, we, don't, we don't put some time in prayer and ask God, God, where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to speak to today? He said, seek my face. Put everything else aside and put God in the center of our focus. Humble, pray, putting God to the center of our focus, and then repentance. Turn from their wicked way. <laughs> repentance is not, okay, God, I messed up, I sinned. Uh, forgive me for that sin. Repentance is when we agree with God that we've sinned and then change it. We take what we've done and we fill it, we, we get rid of it and we fill it with the things of God. Too, too often people come to the altar and they don't get victory because they drop their burden and they get up, they go sit back down and that burden just follows them right back to the pew. hundred years ago, I quit smoking. Went to the altar at Diamond Oaks Baptist Church. Took my cigarettes out of my pocket and laid them on the altar. And I took my cigarette lighter and laid it on the altar. And I prayed and sought God's face about relieving me of that, of that habit. And, and, and I asked him to take it away from me and all that. <laughs> and we had a fellowship afterwards. And I thought to myself, you know, that lighter had the kitty off emblem. The ship I was on had that emblem on the front of it. I, I could just keep that as a keepsake. And I went back into the church to find my cigarettes and lighter laying on the altar. Somebody stole it. I asked the preacher, I said, Preacher, did you get, my, did you get those cigarettes and lighter off the altar? He said, no, I did not. I asked the music director, no, I did not. I asked my Sunday school teacher, no, I did not. I'd like to tell you a couple months later, I seen a guy lighting up and he had my lighter. No, I, that's not true. I don't know who got him. But somebody 
wanted it more than I did, and they took my cigarettes and lighter off of the altar, and it disturbed and upset me so bad that within a week I smoked again. And I smoked and ran from God for years and years and years. Until finally, I got a hold of God's face, or God got a hold of my face. And he said, I want you to pay attention right here, son. This is what I want for your life. I want you to, I want you to preach. Oh, God, you've made a mistake. I, I, I can't preach. I don't know anything about preaching. And God says, you don't have to know. All you got to do is be willing. I'll do the rest of it. But God, you don't understand. I, I smoke and I can't serve you. He goes, good point. You need to quit. But God, you don't understand. I'm addicted. And he said, Am I not more powerful addiction than that? 